So that's what it took to separate them, huh? What a crazy title decider. You know that. But on this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast and Pitch to Podium, we're going to ask the big questions, or at least big to those really involved in the world of Formula 1. It's been getting our minds really excited. It's probably one of the only things that are running in all of our minds right now. It, it got us so excited that millions of people around the world simultaneously saw their heart rate spike. And what else can do that about from live sport? But... Live sport also raises some big questions and today we're going to start off by asking the question, would the FIA have acted differently if this wasn't a title decider? What about that agreement the race director had with all the teams about letting the teams go racing, preferably under green, green flag conditions when the end came about? Was Lewis Hamilton robbed? Yeah, it's a big one, isn't it? But we, we have to come to that. Is Max Verstappen a lucky champion? Yeah, you can see it by my tone, you probably have an answer, but more on that and more on this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast and Pits to Podium. So don't forget to listen in. Let's go. Ah, yes, I have jumbled up the intro, much like the FIA have jumbled up the race canal. This is outstanding about how high-pressure situations can actually get to people. What a tremendous finale. And oh, I've also forgotten to introduce who we are. Firstly, myself, Somal Arora, the host of the Driving Force on Disney Plus Hotstar, joined by Kunal Shah, the former marketing head of the Force India F1 team. Ah, okay, take a deep breath and exhale. Has, has, it, has it calmed down, Kunal? Has it settled in for you properly? Yeah, it settled in maybe for me an hour after the race and so oh, on. on. And then, of course, uh, w- w- what kept us all engaged were the protests and then the intention to appeal and then all those all those things that happened. So, and then the mockery, as people have been calling it, irrespective <sighs> of whether your favorite driver won or not. And, you know, I... I've, I, I I just remembered something, or rather, I just thought of something very funny based on your introduction. Mm-hmm. That's what it took to settle the title. The FI was probably like, you know what? We gave you 21 races <laughs> to pick it between yourself. We <laughs> interfered in most of them, some of them, but we, you guys still couldn't come out and decide who it was. And yes, we wanted one driver to win. We wanted a change. We wanted the younger generational win, whatever. And of course, I'm making up all this as I go, guys. So please don't jump the gun. <laughs> and that's when they said, you know what? Five laps to the end, one lap to the end. We're going to get into action. We're going to settle this right here. Uh, and that's what had happened. And, uh, you know, Fernando Alonso put it very, very well on Ziggo Sport. Mm-hmm. And I'm, of course, extrapolating from that. Uh, first, he said it was luck. He said if there was the safety car ending, Lewis would have been champion. And since there wasn't a safety car ending, Max was champion. So, yes, if you're a Max champion, or sorry, if you're a Lewis fan, or even if you're a neutral Formula One fan, yes, luck was a massive, massive, massive deciding factor in the 2021 Formula One yep. World Championship. But if you're a Max Verstappen fan, you can actually take that a little further, saying luck is what cost Max. Uh, points in Baku, in Silverstone, in Hungary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here comes what uh, Fernando thought was the second word that sort of settled the championship, which was justice. And he said justice was done in the end by letting Max win because you asked, was Max a lucky champion? Hell no, he is the most worthy champion this season, most worthy driver yeah. to win the championship this season, statistically unbeatable record. Yes, Lewis was really strong. Lewis gave a massive fight. Lewis deserved it as much. But just because, you know, Max won because of that last lap safety car doesn't mean he was a lucky champion. He, both drivers deserved it and it played out the way it did. Yeah, exactly. Uh, But I don't get that justice part from Fernando. He can be, he can be a bit tricky at times, but the fact of the matter is, statistically, as you mentioned, Kunal, there was nobody better than Max, a most consistent driver. And Max Verstappen did not have a bad day as a driver this whole season. I mean, if that isn't a candidate worthy for winning the World Championship, I don't know who is. But it's it's the ending. It's the way it happened that stings. And honestly, had this been fair, nobody would have batted an eyelid about whether it was Max, whether it was Lewis. Luck happens, right? I mean, the same luck that took Max out of Baku's... I mean, what... 
goes around, comes around in a way. So you could point out to something like that. But it's this one question that Nityanand, our in-house data analyst, the expert, asked us after the race was done. And it's a really good one, Kunal. Would the FIA have acted differently if this wasn't the last race of the season? I have a few choice words about the FIA, but after you. That's a very, very interesting question. And to my mind, uh, of course, there is no way we can answer that, right? Yeah. Uh, to my mind, two races stood out this season. First was the Spa, the race in Spa, the Belgian Grand Prix, and then, of course, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Uh, and then there was this whole discussion around uh, the general agreement that the teams have with the race control with the race director that they want a race to not end under safety car conditions unless really, really needed. And hence, the race director, the race control here applied their discretion to say, you know what, just five cars between Lewis and Max, we let them unlap themselves. Let's start the race. Let's have a one lap finish to the end and, and so on. So that 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 uh, general agreement, let's mm-hmm. remember, my understanding is it's not written down. It's like the gentleman's agreement on qualifying that Nikita Mazepin talks about every qualifying session. Okay. Uh, it's just an agreement that, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we should give a, give them a show. We shouldn't end it under a safety car. And that general agreement is probably what Mercedes would have agreed to Red Bull, Ferrari, all of them. There has to be a unanimous agreement. And that's what probably cost Mercedes that, that, you know, mm. that agreement, if it was there, that's what, that's what I would say. So, Yes, if it was a title decider, would the FIA have acted differently? Maybe that's the feeling. And maybe that's why a lot of experts, a lot of pundits believe that this was manipulated by the FIA. The FIA interfered, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of trigger the result in a different way. And yeah, maybe the FIA, let's hope, would have done the same if Max was leading yeah. and Lewis was chasing and they would have acted the same way. Again, there's no way to know this, Solomon. Yeah, but it, it honestly baffles me, Kunal, that rules can be changed in the middle of a race like that. Uh, it, it's a bit surprising. Okay, the, the interesting part is the FIA has come out with a justification saying that the following article overrides the fact that uh, the all the cars don't quite need to get past the leader if the safety cars in this lap message is displayed. But doesn't that mean the race director has too much power over the safety cars? I mean, if if you have written an extremely long article detailing the procedure and the process of a safety car only to override it in the immediately next article, what's the point of that article in the first place? Why did you come up with the procedures initially? And it it got to a feeling where the race director felt like the TV director canal, where, oh, what, what do we need to do? Well, one more lap, fine, we'll do it. Uh, but ideally, this should have ended either like Brazil 2012, uh, where we had a safety car finish, a cosmetic safety car finish with the car inside the pit lane, but its influence being outside the line as well. Or maybe, I don't know, red flag it. Time was on their side. That would have been equally as dramatic, right? Seeing a two-lap sprint between, between Lewis and Max on fair tyres. I don't think anybody would have hated that per se. So it, it absolutely baffles me. And if the rules can turn around so quickly, so easily in the middle of a race... I mean, what's even the point of sport? I mean, I'll just play cricket tomorrow. I mean, on the World Cup level, I'll take my bat and I'll go home. Who's to stop me if the rules can be changed like that? It's baffling. (laughs) It's it's absolutely baffling. You know, you're you're absolutely right about the red car because that's the precedent that the FIA set in Baku. Yeah. Right? We had a two-lap sprint at the end and that was the first sprint race of the history of Formula 1 before the actual sprint race that... That sort of happened, right? And to my mind, that could have been fair. That, hey, let's red flag it. Let the two protagonists get fair, equal drivers, well, tires in and, and, you know, let it be decided on track rather than, you know, the apparent disadvantage that happened. But for some strange reason, they did not change that. And that's the question that I would love for Michael Massey to be asked uh, in this regard. And let's remember, guys, I know it's a lot of hate, a lot of, uh, questions being raised uh, against Michael Massey, people saying he needs to be sacked, he needs to be replaced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Michael Massey is just the public face yeah. of race control. It's not him alone. It's the race control. He's got a team of people advising him. Yes, he takes the final call. Uh, yes, he's he's the one that you know sort of speaks to the teams and so on. And so, 
I don't think it's just fair to single him out. Of course, you know, it's it's easier to name one person than a group of un- anonymous individual people, right? But uh, the bottom line from this, Somel, is I think Formula One will just... And now I'm being philosophical. I'm putting yeah. on like the, the halo and acting like Saint Kunal Shah. Okay. Is uh, Formula One will actually come out uh, better as a sport after the 2021 Formula One season. And why do I say this? We had races again, like the Belgian Grand Prix and then Abu Dhabi challenge the very ethos of what we call as motor racing uh, adjudication, what we call as a sporting regulations. Uh, then, of course, we've got uh, Max Verstappen, who's been stretching uh, the, the rule book when it comes to overtakes and wheel to wheel action. Uh, you know, it, it, as we know it in Formula One as well. And he's been challenging that as well. You know, what we saw in Brazil wasn't mm-hmm. allowed in Saudi Arabia. And then, you know, uh, wasn't was acted upon differently in Abu Dhabi as well. So when all of, when the dust settles, let's really hope that it is Formula One that benefits from all these funny situations, if that's no. a lighter word I can use, or farcical situations, if I can be a little more critical. I don't know. Yeah, it's really absurd. I think the best way to tackle this one is what Alpine did on the team radio in the USA. They came on air and asked, Michael... Is it allowed to overtake outside the circuit? No, it is not. Okay, Michael, that is what Kimi Raikkonen did. Is that allowed? No, it is not. Then do your job. Uh, but it's not Michael Massey who decides the racing regulations. It's, it's the stewards that enact upon it. So you're right about that, Kunal. It's not entirely his fault, but come on. It can't continue this way. And would Red Bull... I mean, uh, if there's one learning I've taken from this whole season, it's that never read anything that Christian Honor says. If it's any code that comes up from him, scroll right through because his opinions will always be biased towards Red Bull Racing. Fair enough, right? That's his job. He's supposed to do that. But Red Bull Racing uh, would come out and their fans would come out and say, oh, well, they're crybabies. But put Red Bull in the situation and they would do the same. I mean, imagine, I mean, not imagine, just remember what they did back in Silverstone. They rented out an entire circuit to put Alex Albon in a car to replicate the crash to come up with new evidence. So it's not like Mercedes are crybabies for that. Anyone would be in that situation. But they've they've taken this at least a night later with a lot of grace, Kunal. I think apparently they are thinking of not completing their appeal to uh, take action in the FIA court. So I don't know. It's the worst way to settle a championship, isn't it? It is. You know, uh, settling in Settling it in court, if Lewis wins his eighth in court, I don't think he'll be half as happy that he had to sort of do that. And again, you know, the run of form he had, he deserved it at that moment. You know, we've been saying how it's always been even when you have the fastest package, maximize all your points because you never know when you're going to run out of that. And that's what Max and Lewis did at all all the times. And the only difference was that uh, Mercedes's form came in at a very, very strong and late point, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, through the season. But yes, like, like, like we are saying, you know, overall, it cannot, it should not. Let's hope not that it continues like this. And one very straightforward, you know, point about this is: on one hand, Formula One is wanting to attract more manufacturers. Audi, Porsche, you know, and they're trying to do all it takes to get more and more people. But on the other hand, if there is a slight hint of bias, it's a slight hint of, you know, the the the, the bitter the, the bitter aftertaste that Abu Dhabi has left on us. You know, it's very difficult to to put a finger on it. Hey, what was it that caused it? Because it wasn't a single action apart from just the last lap, right? Uh, so so. Formula One as a whole, Liberty Media, FIA, will want to sit down and put this in place saying, we will run robust when it comes to our adjudication of the Grand Prix uh, race operations as a whole uh, and not be seen as consistently inconsistent. That's the word to do that, (laughs) not be seen as biased. And uh, to be be fair, I don't think they were biased because on the first lap of the race, they had yeah. a decision that went in favor of Lewis Hamilton. But on the last lap of the race, or the second, the penultimate lap of the race, they had a decision that went against Lewis Hamilton. But that's just how it goes, Samuel. Yeah, and uh, let's actually talk about that first lap incident in a second. In my opinion, it, it wasn't quite enough from Lewis, but I want to know your take on that. But before we get to that part, Kunal, uh, 
Lewis wasn't the only driver impacted by the whole safety car and only half the lap cars being allowed, right? Because Carlos Sainz effectively was complaining slightly, and not not immediately because he was elated to get a podium, but he said that, well, considering all that happened, had the lap cars in front of me also been led by, maybe I could have been fighting for the win. Who knows? So that's one element. Daniel yeah. Ricciardo was confused. Lando Norris said that it was made for TV. Make of it what you will. But the interesting part is, Kunal, that... Uh, you're right, the bias wasn't 100% evident. Well, what do you think of that first lap incident that happened right there? Um, I think the whole let them race philosophy needs a needs a far more important definition of things, I would say. It's a great attitude to have, right? But it's not. it doesn't always result in the most fair decision-making. And... Uh, it's difficult to isolate the first lap incident in itself, knowing exactly what happened in Brazil, Abu Dhabi, blah, 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 blah. And maybe this is where, you know, the, the technological greats in the world of IT, Elon Musk or Naval Ravi Kant or Balaji Srinivasan will turn around and say, we will write a blockchain code and we will let machine learning and artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. uh, you know, adjudicate and do what the, the FI did, did, did next, Samuel. So, Maybe that's what it, it it's it's what it's going to take. You know, remove the human biases and permanent stewarding. Pay them for it. And lot, like I said, you know, whatever it is that they do, uh, Formula One will come off better off as a sport. And uh, again, it's been rumored that Ross Brown has already made a statement that they're going to have a rule where team principals cannot speak to the race director in the middle of a race. And that's going to be something that's going to come. So, you know, Kimi Raikkonen, not on the race next year, not on the grid next year. Again, radio ratings will drop. If the FIA radio channel is uh, blank or silent during such kind of, you know, interesting races, again, the radio ratings will drop, Samuel. Ross, no, this is so not good. <laughs> Sorry, I, I tried. I tried to do my Toto Wolf accent. Oh, come on. Again? Sometimes entertainment can go a bit too far and that's what Ross Brown thinks about the whole thing. But now, Kunal, we have to talk about something a little bit else as well, right? Something apart from Lewis versus Max because I think we've done that a while. We've speak, spoken about the FIA for a while as well. Sergio Perez. Now, in, in hindsight, it seems a bit irrelevant, all things considered. But come on, that defending was just amazing. Probably one of the better battles of the year. The way he just held out on his own for his teammate Max Verstappen. Actually, two questions for you, Kunal. Have you got down to the bottom of exactly why Sergio was pulled out from the race? And how would you rate his defending on the whole? A bit irrelevant, as I mentioned, because eventually he took a safety car. But still, that that was feisty. It was feisty. And, you know, people were, of course, there's, uh, there's rumours that Checo's engine wasn't doing well. They were afraid it would blow. And if it blew, maybe the safety car would have stayed out longer. And they wanted to eliminate that. Uh, that could have been one. Uh, I, I mean, eventually, you know, it's it's just that. But it doesn't take away from the fact that Checo Perez drove humongously awesome. And that's, mm. again, the wrong adjective. But incredibly awesome uh, in those two laps that he was defending against Lewis. That's what, uh, you know, they needed. Red Bull needed all along. A wingman they could depend on so much. And... He was so intelligent in his defense. Imagine driving a Formula One car uh, five seconds slower. That's slower than what even Nikita Mazepin does in a race car, right? So being in the fastest car, but driving slower than the slowest car on the grid. And he he actually helped Max by at least seven to eight seconds over the course of those two, three laps. And the gap literally went down from, you know, nine, 10 odd seconds to about two seconds. Of course, it made no difference in the end, given the pace and the comfortable pace that Lewis had throughout. But yes, incredible stuff. You know, Checo did, he took points away in, in Baku, right? Uh, He of course was battling like crazy in Turkey. Uh, He's been giving toes uh, in qualifying. To Max Verstappen, he's been the driver to get the upgrades much later than Max, but he, of course, is involved in the testing of those upgrades. So very, very solid and robust uh, wingman for Max to have. Great that Christian, Helmet, all of Red Bull Racing, including Max Verstappen, have been doffing their hats to him for his role in the title uh, win this uh, season. As they should. It was tremendous. And let's wait and see if we can maybe bring out a little bit more in terms of race results. 
I'm being an Indian parent, am I? Ah, um, oh, grammar, come on. I'm being an Indian parent, aren't I? Considering that I'm always asking for a little bit more from Sergio Perez. Now, it's just a feeling of, you know that this guy can do so much more, right? So, in the end, worked out for Max Verstappen, worked out for the team. But I just want to see Sergio Perez fighting on his own as well in 2022. That'll be awesome. But speaking of things awesome, speaking of 2022... Things look good for Ferrari. Now, this isn't the 2022 preview. This isn't the 2021 season review. But we must talk about Carlos Sainz's race. The whole season, we'll do it in, in depth in a different episode. But this was amazing, Kunal. P3 in the end. He looked a bit uncomfortable after, of course, Verstappen came out there. The bit sliding around here and there. But eventually, to take out this result and to beat Norris and Leclerc, in our episode for the preview, we said that this is going to be a long shot. But my word, he's taken the long shot and smashed it out of the park. Amazing. I Carlos Sainz, you know, the the puzzling part is Red Bull let him go because they chose Max Verstappen. So he was sort of number two there. At Ferrari, he's still assumed to be the number two driver, you know. And here in his first ever season with Ferrari, he's gone and he's got more podiums than uh, than uh, uh you know, Charles Leclerc in, in his first season, he's finished ahead. He's been battling with Lando Norris. And, uh, you know, it, I think it was fantastic. I'm excited to see what he can do in 2022 and how the whole battle between the Ferrari drivers actually shapes up because two very promising talents and nobody thought that signs would out, outscore, out, outperform Charles over the course of a full season. And plus, of course, uh, let's rub it in for the Charles Leclerc fans. I don't mean it, but Carlos Sainz has a Monaco GP podium as well. Sorry, sorry, but but yeah. another driver. And the sprint race podium, if we call it that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly that, yeah, and, and that as well. So good, good year for him all around. We'll discuss more on him in depth. But a couple of other things on our plate canal. Uh, oh, sorry, here we are. A couple of other things on our plate canal. Yuki Sonora, P4. Wow, well, I'm... Uh, we, we said it on a live watch along on Paytm Insider for the Inside Line F1 podcast that Yuki Tsunoda has some special affiliation with the Middle East that he always seems to be so confident over there. P4 is just outstanding. Beating Pierre Gasly fair and square all the way through. I don't know about you. Signs look good for next year. But again, it, it could be a false alarm as well. It could be one bad race or one really extremely good race and that could hide the cracks. I don't know. I want this to be good. But all things considered, this was amazing from Yuki. Be- best that you could ask for. He did, and he actually overtook Valtteri Bottas on yeah. the penultimate lap or the last lap of the race to actually get P4. So it wasn't just uh, one Red Bull driver that overtook a Mercedes to gain uh, track position, I would say. <laughs> exactly. But finally, before we go, Kunal, Kimi Raikkonen. Did he leave in the most Kimi Raikkonen way possible? Avoiding interviews, avoiding any drama, very quiet, very silent. Uh, and even in his race, it seemed like he didn't want to do the the extra effort, which is what one can think of for Kimi, right? He's never quite been willing to put that thousand miles extra in terms of fitness and everything. As It's all well documented. So, pretty classic way to go, no? Uh, well, yeah, it's a little unconventional. I yeah. thought last la- last race of the season, we'll see Kimi do some donuts and yeah. a special radio message, blah, 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 and all of that. But of course, nothing came of it. And uh, he's probably... I think he's 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 not gonna he's not done with Formula One yet. I think we're still gonna see Kimi in and around, and I I think it's it's uh, it's great that a career has ended and a new junior driver's career will sort of start in 2022. And on that note, actually, thank you very much for all the entertainment, Kimi. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, you don't get drivers and characters like him these days in Formula One, Samuel. Unintentional characters, by the way. I mean, he didn't want to be this way, unlike what many other drivers may tend to be normally these days. But what a man, what a career and what a season. I hope, I hope you had a good time listening to us on the Inside Line F1 podcast and Pitch the Podium this year. But it's not done yet. We are going to have a season review episode. We are going to have tons of stuff in the winter to keep you all very excited. So don't just forget about us like that. Or at least we'll try our best to make sure that you don't forget about us. But I hope you had a good time this season. It was amazing doing this, Kunal, this whole year. And there's more stuff coming, as I said. So, folks, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we shall see you rather soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Samuel.